Fun. They say, I'll give you homework. Just like at school, they give you homework. I want you to go home and chop off your hand and then put it under a bus. You can put it in a paper bag if you want so no one sees it. Put it under a bus and let the bus run over it. And you tell me whether you feel any pain or not when that happens. So when the hand is connected to the body, it's very, very important. And you put a lot of stress on it. And you can do so many things with it. But when it's disconnected, you can't. Similarly, your body. When your body is disconnected from you, you can put your whole body under the bus. And you won't feel anything. Isn't that amazing? It's hard to believe that you could lie underneath a 15-ton bus and feel nothing. But it is a reality because if you're not in the body, how are you going to feel anything? So therefore, it must be concluded that because you're inside the body, you're feeling things. But not that the body is feeling things. That's logic, isn't it? It's very logical. Just like you're inside your car, when someone hits your car, you feel it. But if someone hits your car when you're not in it, you don't feel it until you see the car, isn't it? When you come back and you find your car's been crushed, you feel, oh, Immediately you go into anxiety. But when it actually happened, you don't feel it. The reason is, is because you weren't in your car. When you're in your car, then someone hits your car, you become angry. You say, why did you hit me, you fool? Or so many things happen. So the thing is that what really is important is that thing which is in the body. So when I say that most people don't know that I... When we talk about I as identification, most people don't actually know what is I. They think they know because according to our mind, I am a body. According to my mind, I'm English or Irish. According to my mind, I'm 40 years of age or 30 years of age. According to my mind, I've got a job, I've got a flat, I've got a girlfriend, I've got this, I've got that. There's so many things in my mind which are telling me things. Now, they're not telling the dead body the same things because when you leave your body, the body becomes actually vacated. And you find this, that people, when they leave their body, you go to see them in the hospital and say, oh, I'm sorry, he's gone. You go, where's he gone? He's lying on the bed. No, 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 he's gone, he's gone. It looks like he's on the bed, but he's not. But you could argue, you could say, no, 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 look, for goodness sake, he's lying on the bed, I can mm -hmm. see his legs. The doctor said, no, no, he passed away. So, these are very important things, because if we don't understand these things, then we're living in illusion, isn't it? If we don't really know who we are, how could we possibly make ourselves happy? We don't even know what we are. So when you say, I want to be happy, what is that I that wants to be happy? If you say, I want to be perfect, what is that I? So, Vedic philosophy begins with understanding. Atata Brahma Jignasya means to, Brahma Jignasya, to understand what I am. We must begin to understand what we are. Otherwise, we can't function. We are malfunctioning. In the material world, people are identifying with the body as the self. They're thinking that I am this body. Now that means, basically, that you're born, you get old, you get diseased, and you're going to die. That's your whole history, your whole story in life. You can write, I can tell you what's going to happen to you in the future. You're going to get old, you're going to get diseased, you're going to die. So I can, I'm a fortune teller. Now you can tell that about every single person on this planet. Whether it's a worm, you can go up to the worm and you say, I know what's going to happen to you. You're going to get old, you're going to get diseased, you're going to die. If it's a human, if it's a cow, if it's a goat, if it's a chicken, you can go and tell all their futures. You don't need to be, you don't need to throw anything in the air or make any kind of cosmic arrangement. Basically, you can tell, as soon as that person takes on a body, 
then they're going to get old, they're going to get diseased, they're going to die. Now, they may do a lot of other things in between. For instance, they might do uh, this or they might do that. But you'll find, if you study, that the body itself is working on a certain arrangement. The way the body works is the same for every one of us. It's not that one person swallows food through his ears and another person eats food through its nose. We all do exactly the same thing. The only difference we have is individually we are thinking differently. Individually we are thinking differently so that thinking process is very important because one has to understand that the subtle thinking is the beginning of our problem not the body. Many people think that their body is the problem. Just like you might be thinking, well, my body is causing me misery. The body doesn't really cause you misery. It's your attachment to the body that causes you misery. You see? Just like I gave the example of the car. When we're in the car and it has a crash, we become disturbed. If we weren't in the car, we wouldn't be disturbed. Isn't it? So therefore, it's the attachment to the car that's disturbing you, not the car. Some people who are very, very wealthy, if the car was in a crash or something, or let's say it's insured, they go, oh, don't worry, it's insured. Isn't it? Sometimes you crash into someone, they're glad you crashed into them. Because they can claim on the insurance. They go, don't worry about it. Give it another bash, will you, so I can get the money on it. So they're quite happy. I remember one time I saw one of these transporters, it flipped over, crushed about five cars. Luckily, there was no one in the cars, or at least I think there was. But uh, one guy whose car was crushed, he was in bliss. He went, oh, great, I got rid of it at last. So he could claim, you see. So in one sense, it's relative, isn't it? One man could come and go, oh, no, my car. He could become a nervous wreck, commit suicide or anything. You don't know what he's going to do. And another man can come along and be overjoyed. Why? Because the attachment is different. That's all. The same thing is happening, but the mental attachment is different. Those who are attached to the body suffer. And those who are attached to the body get some pleasure. Matrishpashish to Kuntaya, Krishna says, Matrishpashish to Kuntaya, Shitoshna, Sukha Dukha Da, that there is some Sukha and Dukha in this world. Sukha means pleasure. Dukha means displeasure. And these are called the relativities. Hare Krishna. We live in a rel relative environment. So, sometimes, when we say, relatively speaking, we are happy, what it means is, the conditions are making us happy. You see? It's very important to uh, study this word of conditions. The conditions are making us happy. When it's sunny, one man feels happy. And when it's sunny, another man feels miserable. You see? For instance, as an example, if you're in Saudi Arabia and you said it's sunny today, that doesn't mean you're going to be happy because it's 128 degrees. So, another man living in Scotland he may say, oh, today it's sunny, and he feels happy. So, it's not the sunshine that's making him happy. It's the relative condition. Just like, for instance, I give an example, water. Water, if you jump into it, sometimes it can make you very happy. Many people, they go to the Mediterranean, and they jump in the water, and they feel very happy. But at the same time, if you jump in the water and it's 25 below zero, you won't feel happy. But does that mean that the water is causing you misery? Or does it mean the water is causing you pleasure? The water does not cause pleasure or pain. Water is water. What is causing happiness and pain is how you relate to the water. What is your relationship with the water? 
If you are in the middle of winter and you jump in the water, you're not going to have a good relationship with the water. You're going to freeze. So you become unhappy. So the important thing is our relationship with that thing. The thing itself is not the problem. It's our relationship with that thing. The body is not the cause of our suffering. It's our relationship with our body. You see? For instance, many people when they get old, they become disturbed. When their hair starts to fall out, is not a good thing. For instance, if you suddenly comb your hair and half of it comes off, or if your teeth fall out at breakfast, if you're having a cornflakes and you find your teeth in your cornflakes. So, to some people that would be very disturbing because they would start to think, oh, what's going on here? Isn't it? Because the body is starting to disintegrate. What happens is with anything material, doesn't matter what it is, you can pick a most beautiful rose, it will only last a certain time and then it starts, you throw it away because it starts to bug you. It starts to look like some shriveled up old flower. The same rose, when you give it to your loved one, just like a boy, a boy gives the girl a beautiful rose. So the girl gets very excited. But the same rose, when it becomes withered, and it becomes disturbing to the mind. You see? Because the natural inclination of consciousness is that we are attracted to certain conditions. So when it says Matrashpashis to Kuntaya, Shitoshna Sukha Da, it means that we're attracted to certain conditions and we're repulsed by other conditions. Now, I'll give you a good example. Our body. We love our body. I mean, it's the best thing we've got, isn't it? We can't... We're not going to get any better. It could get worse. But it's not going to get much better, isn't it? I mean, we can put on all sorts of eau de cologne or makeup and we can put on all sorts of funny things to make it look a bit better or we can get, get a bit stretched here and a bit stretched there or whatever. But the point is that generally things are not going to get much better. So, we are very much attached to our body. But actually, it's not the attachment of the body, we're attached to the condition of the body. You understand my point? We're attached to what condition it's in. We want it to be in a very good condition. But unfortunately, the body itself is influenced by circumstances what, what is in and out, in and out, in and out. Is affected by circumstances which are beyond our control. So the important thing really is control. Who's in control of this thing? You see? Just like if you get in, in a car going down a motorway 100 miles an hour, right? It can be a great ride. You can be enjoying yourself, listening to your stereo, laying back. But if your driver is suddenly falling asleep on you and your car's going this way and that way and he's insisting, no, no, it's all right, don't worry. You get an anxiety. So the same thing that was giving you pleasure now is causing you a tremendous amount of anxiety. Just like a good example, unfortunately, is Princess Diana. She was having a wonderful dinner at the Ritz with her boyfriend on her way back to wherever and uh, in a nice big swanky car and all sorts of London luxuries. But the thing was that suddenly it went out of control. So it's not the actual thing which is the problem, it's who's controlling the thing. So your body, in under certain conditions, brings you certain types of happiness. And under certain conditions, it causes you certain types of distress. So therefore, what we're doing throughout our whole life is we're trying to adjust the conditions. Our whole lifetime is about making adjustments in the conditions. For instance, we build a house because we couldn't live in the grass. It would be a lot cheaper if you could go and live in a field, put your pillow down, lie down, have a sleep, get up and go to work. You save yourself a lot of money on mortgages, electricity bills, 
so many other bills, wouldn't you? But the conditions are not favorable. Whereas if you go to Africa, people put a piece of mud up, lie on a bed, take food, it's growing on the trees. They're happy. I've been there, I've seen them. They have very little income. Practically no income, but they're very happy living like that because that's actually, to them, very nice because it's beautiful warm weather. There's lots of mangoes and avocados and grains and food. They have much better life. I mean, all this thing about the poor starving in Africa, in actual honesty, it's the poor starving here in Birmingham or London that we should worry about because they don't have a problem. I haven't seen it. I traveled all over East Africa and West Africa, and I can tell you they are absolutely abundant in foodstuffs and extremely cheap in price. And I've also found that they're happier people, to be honest. To be frank, I've found them much happier, much nicer to deal with, much better. So in one sense, one could argue, but hang on a minute, they surely they've got to be worse off than us because we've got better conditions. That's the only thing we can say against any country. We've got better conditions because we've got videos. <laughs> they haven't got videos. I mean, they've got beautiful scenery, they've got mangoes, avocados, they've got food growing in their garden, they've got all sorts of one, but they haven't got videos. So we beat them. But in actuality, you can't be happy from a video. The only way you're happy from a video is because what's in the video, what's showing on the video, that's what you think makes you happy. There's no, no one's actually fell in love with a video, have they? You don't fall in love with a video. What people like from the video is that it changes our condition. When we're bored, when we're sitting there bored stiff, looking at the same wallpaper every day, day in, day out, we think, I'll put on a video. That will make me happy. When I watch this video, I'm going to be happy. So then they sit there, Google-eyed for hours, watching this film, thinking, God, oh, when is this going to end? Oh, no, this is making me happy. This is making me happy. And then they rush out and get another one. Because that one they watched wasn't quite, didn't quite do it. It didn't quite make them happy. But there's another one down there because there was thousands in the shop. And I saw one, I'm sure, that one will make me happy. So then when they get that one, they sit and watch it, and then they go, now I'm happy. I'm happy now, this is a good one. And then at the end of it, they go, the wallpaper again. The wallpaper. So, what is it that's making them happy is not the video or the film, it's simply some change in their conditions. That's why variety is the spice of life, isn't it? Everybody wants variety. We want variety. So really what we're doing is we're creating different types of varieties. And these types of varieties, some of them give us pleasure and some of them give us pain. For instance, we don't like walking, so we build motorways so that we can walk on four wheels very fast, isn't it? We're actually still walking, but it's the wheels are doing it. But in order to make those wheels walk, we need to have an engine, a gearbox, a synchromesh. We need to have tires. We need to have fuel. We need to have metal and plastic. And to do that, we need to have factories. We have to have factories producing tubes and rubber, which pollute the atmosphere. We need chemical to run the petrol, so then we pollute all the atmosphere. And then we need, on top of that, we need all this metal, so we have to mine and the mines, we have to dig down thousands and thousands of feet to get that metal so that we can use it in our car. People have to work 24 hours a day to get the metal, to get the rubber, to get the fuel. And then on top of that, we need to have roads. So we have to have millions. I saw one stretch of road, which was tiny, 36 million pounds for that one stretch, which was only a tiny piece of road in London. Not a motorway, not a gigantic inter... Uh, continental motorway. It was a tiny piece of stretch in London, wasn't it? We were there. 36 million pounds. Now, where does 36 million pounds come from? We give it to the tax department who put it on our car. We give it to the government who tax us. So, in consideration, we spend millions and billions and billions so we don't have to walk. <laughs> you see? And then, because now we're not walking, we're driving in cars, 
We kill 30 to 60,000 people a year, maim them, cripple them, not to speak of the animals. So all these poor people in America, it's something like 68,000 people a year get killed by cars. And then on top of that, there's probably 150,000 who get maimed, crippled for life, knocked down. But all of that because we don't want to walk. So in the material world, as soon as you try to change the conditions, immediately you've got anxiety. You've got anxiety. So when Krishna says, What he means is, basically, in the material world there are two things. There's a condition of happiness and there's a condition of distress. Now, nobody goes looking for distress. Nobody wants to stress because stress, when we get stress, anxiety, isn't it? What is anxiety? Anxiety is a disturbance of the mind. Our mind is disturbed, we're in anxiety, we've got some distress. Now, distress comes whether we want it or not. Even if you decide, okay, I'm just going to sit in my room, I'm not going to go out because when I go out I get in distress or I'm not going to do anything, I'm just going to sit here. You still get the stress, isn't it? You still get the stress, even when you just sit somewhere, because suddenly your mind starts causing you distress. It starts saying, what are you doing sitting here? <laughs> and you go, well, I'm sitting there. And the mind says, well, what are you doing sitting here? You shouldn't be sitting there. No, no, I want to sit here. No, 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 you should be enjoying yourself. Really? You see? And then the mind says, how come you're not enjoying yourself? You should be enjoying yourself. You should be happy. Then it says, you're as miserable as sin, aren't you? <laughs> you're really a miserable, rotten person. So that way the mind, and then the, you're thinking, am I? Yeah, I should be happy. I should mix with people. So immediately, even though you decided to sit there, you get into this whole mental, what we call mental anxieties. So in actuality, whether you're inside, outside, upside, downside, you are going to be full of anxiety because the material world is called kunta. The word kunta means uh, that which gives you anxiety. The conditions of this world give you anxiety. Why? Because they are created to give you anxiety. The person who is controlling these conditions is called God. And God created the material creation for a specific purpose. It didn't just happen accidentally like people like to think. Everyone has this idea that maybe the whole thing happened accidentally. But let's see how many things actually do happen accidentally. Now, you've been on this planet for a certain period of time, every one of us. Did you ever accidentally get rich? Did you ever accidentally wake up and found half a million pounds under your bed where you don't know how it got there? Did you ever accidentally go down and find there was huge amounts of food in your, in your cupboard that you didn't know about? Did you ever accidentally find that you had a beautiful house whereas you went to bed it was only an old shack? Suppose you went to bed in a railway station and woke up with a, you know, a huge 400-acre estate with horses and riding paddocks and beautiful swimming pool. No, because we all know realistically that the only things that we cause, call accidents in this world are things which happen to us which we don't like, isn't it? The things which actually we don't like, they're the things we call, oh, that was an accident, isn't it? Because any sane person can understand that things which you do like are never an accident. They're very seldom an accident. Accidents are, there's been an accident on the motorway, person <coughs> lost his leg, this person lost his money, this person this, that. It's always when there's disasters, there's accidents. So that means that actually, generally we identify accidents with chaos. With chaos, confusion, bewilderment or whatever. Now, 
For our own happiness, we spend our whole lifetime making arrangements, which is completely contradictory to the philosophy of accident, because if everything was created by accident, surely the thing which you need, which is happiness, would happen by accident. Isn't it? So it's contradictory to say that, for instance, we say the earth planet happened by accident. That's basically what we're saying in atheistic philosophy. But at the same time, little old me on the earth planet has to spend his whole lifetime making little tiny arrangements to be happy. So if the great accident arranger who arranged all the accident in the universe, surely he could have picked one for me that I could have an accident and become happy. Why is it that I've got to spend my whole lifetime making arrangements so I'm not happy, so I'm, uh, so I am happy? The point is, is that behind every activity there's an intelligence, there's a design, there's an arrangement. Behind this universe there is a most unlimited powerful design. That design is called the desire of God. God, just like you or me, he has a personality. He is a person and he's a designer. We also design things. We design things because God designs things. God, it says in the Bible also that God created the, the man in his own liken to his own image. So the point is, is that we are in the image of God. The difference is, is that our designing is very tiny. Very, very tiny. We design a car or an airplane. Just like Prabhupada gave a very good example. He said, take a jum jumbo 747. Now, it's a very wonderful creation, a big airplane like that. You could say, oh, this is like Concorde or something like that. But why didn't they create it so a male jumbo and a female jumbo? Then you would have baby jumbos. Couldn't you? And then all the problems of buying airplanes would be over. They'd save themselves millions and millions of pounds every year because every, now, every year there'd be hundreds and hundreds of jumbos or a male car and a female car. And then you could have little baby cars. You see? And at the same time, if you see what is a jumbo, it is a, a made up of certain composition, but basically it's the thing which flies in space. That is wonderful. You can sit in a jumbo, watch the movies, have coffee. Little, uh, the hostess comes around and says, would you like anything else? And you feel very happy. But at the same time, this planet is like a big airplane because it's also floating in space. Isn't it? And it hasn't crashed in two and a half billion years. It hasn't crashed yet. Now that's pretty good going, isn't it? If you could have an aircraft in, in the air for two and a half billion years and it doesn't crash, that's a pretty good safety record. I think even TWA or British Airways, they'd, really, they'd be pretty impressed with that. So you can say, yeah, it hasn't crashed because, you know, it's the only thing in space. No, no, there are billions upon billions and billions and billions of other planets out there, all floating around at tremendous speed. Tremendous speed. Much faster than any jumbo. So it's not a good argument to say, well, you know, it didn't crash because it was too far away from another planet. Because actually, there's billions upon billions of planets. So surely... In two and a half billion years, which the scientists say, one of them should have had a good crash. But all the crashes happen 55 billion light years away. It's funny, isn't it? You don't see the local ones. You only see the ones that happen 55 billion light years away. So, when they talk about chaos in the universe, it always happens to be 55 billion light years away. There's no local chaos to talk about. Because the order of the universe is so wonderfully created by God. He doesn't create crashes. We're the ones that are on this planet doing all the crashing. And criticizing him for making big mistakes. We're the ones that have messed up the atmosphere. We're the ones that have messed up the water system. We're the ones that have messed up our lives. We're the ones that have messed up the countryside. We're the ones that have messed up the education of our children. We're the ones that have messed up our relationship with each other. We're the ones that have messed up our political systems. We're the ones that are fighting with each other, killing each other, murdering each other, raping each other, stealing from each other. And we're all blaming God. We're all sitting there going, look, what a mess you made of this place. 
<laughs> this is our consciousness because we're cheaters. The fact of the matter is, is that material energy is created on a certain specific laws. It works without one single microscopic movement beyond what God wants. Now some people will turn around and say, well, why do these bad things happen? That's always the Christian argument or another argument of, well, if God is so great, why does he let that happen? The point is to understand is that you as an individual entity, we are all individuals, we have unique individual independence. And according to Vedic literature, the living entity comes to the material world to exercise his independence under certain laws. Because we are infinitesimal, we are a tiny particle of God, therefore we have, we have infinitesimal capacity. It's like the molecule of sunshine has the quality of the sun. But if there's a little molecule of sun in your room, you can't say the sun planet is in your room. Similarly, we are a tiny fragment of God. Therefore, we have the qualities of God in very, very fragmental, tiny portion. So, we in the material world are acting according to certain desires. Everyone has a desire. That desire is called separatism. We are separatists. Separatist means we have a separate interest from God. Spiritual life means to have no separate interest from God. So we suffer because we've got a separate interest. That's all. If you want to know why you're suffering in this world, it's because you have a separate interest from God. Now, where's a good example of someone who supposedly suffered, but at the same time didn't suffer? In Christian religion, there's Jesus Christ. Apparently, he was crucified on the cross. Three days later, he was walking around. You see? Because he had no separate interest. Those who have the same interest of God are not controlled by material laws. Because the actual living entity, the soul himself, does not belong in the separatist environment. The material, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that this material energy is my separated energy. My separated. This earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego. They are my separated energy. The soul has nothing to do with these energies. The soul belongs in the spiritual world with God. But because he has forgotten that eternal relationship with God, he is living in ignorance. Krishna consciousness means to wake up wake up the consciousness to understand that actually this entire cosmic universe is God's creation. It is his sporting ground. You know when you have sport, sport means you do things because they are there to give you pleasure. God enjoys creating the universe. He creates it in his form as Vishnu. Why does God enjoy creating such a horrible place? That is always a big question. Because God's business, his desire, is to fulfill the desires of every living entity. We are part and parcel of God. So in order for us to pursue our independence of God, he gives us a particular type of body. Just like your son or your daughter. A man has a son and a daughter. Now, the son and daughter may want to do things that you don't want to do. Many parents experience it. When the children grow up and they want to go and they want to listen to a certain type of music, they want to hang out with a certain type of people, they have a different philosophy, they have a different... So, what does the father do? Out of love, he has to accommodate the child, even though he may not agree. But because there's a relationship with the child, the father allows the child. Sometimes the child wants to go to a disco. The father and mother say, oh, it's not good to go to these discos. You might meet this, you might, this might happen, that. But actually, at the end of the day, most parents end up giving the child the money to go to the disco. Isn't it? Even though they don't want them to do it, because their affection is there. Similarly, because the living entity wants to enjoy independently of Krishna, and Krishna has affection, 
Man proposes and God disposes. Krishna creates the facilities. Now, because sometimes we're having a really good time, because there are a lot of people on this planet who would tell you, I'm having a great time. I don't care a hoot about God. As far as I'm concerned, whether he lives or exists doesn't mean a... I've got my money, I've got my facilities, I've got my enjoyment, and I don't need to God. He keeps you God. He got a problem, and you need God. As far as I'm concerned, I don't need God. So it's not that everyone is suffering. There's a lot of people who are happy that they would consider to be great times. And they say, thank you very much. But when people do suffer, that's when they blame God. You never see anyone writing an article saying that, look what God did, I won the lottery last week. I mean, why should he go and do something like that? Who in the world is? When they complain, they complain when things go wrong, not when they go right. So every when things are going good for you, nobody's thinking about God. Only very few people. But when things are going wrong, that's when he blew it. That's when he made all the mistakes. That's when he got his homework wrong. That's when he did his arithmetic wrong. God did everything wrong when things don't go the way you want them to go. Then he's a big bad God and he should be sacked or he's dead or he's senile or he's an old cripple in the hills or whatever he is. But when everything's going right, there's no mention of God. You see? So people when they're enjoying, it's when they're suffering. Now why is there suffering? Suffering is there to remind us, to awaken us, to understand that we don't belong in this environment. We don't belong here. It is not our environment. Why? Because it's inferior. Anything which is separate from God, of course there's no separation from God because in one sense God creates everything, so it's also his energy, but this energy is created in ignorance. And when there is ignorance of God, there is misery. You see, just like a child. If you take a child, separate it from its mother. You can experiment with that. Take a five-year-old, well, you shouldn't do it, you get arrested. But anyway, <laughs> if you took a five-year-old child from his mother and you put it in the Hilton Hotel and gave it all sorts of wonderful facilities and this and that, and that, that child would cry its eyes out. Because the separation from the mother is intolerable doesn't matter what you give the child. It will not be happy because the child cannot be happy without the mother. Similarly, the living entity cannot be happy without God. It is not possible. He may entertain himself for a while. He may run around for a while flapping around thinking he's getting somewhere or he may have so many illusions. But in actuality, he can never be happy. So actually... The misery of the material world is the mercy of God. It is the compassion of God because he's actually showing us you don't belong here, you fool. Wake up. Wake up to understand that this is not your real position. So therefore, old age is the kindness of God. Because when you get old, you begin to, every, you go into any church in this country and I will guarantee you 95% of the congregation is over the age of 55. Isn't it? You go to any Hindu temple and you'll find that most of the congregation are at least over the ages of 40s. You go to any synagogue, the same thing. Right? At the same time, you go down to any nightclub or disco for young people, you won't find anyone talking about God. Isn't it? So, really, if, you, if we all stayed young, we'd all still be popping around in discos for millions of lifetimes. So, it's due to the kindness of Krishna that he shows us that when we're getting ready to go to disco, we, oh, oh, my back, oh, I think I'm, oh, I'm getting too old for this. Isn't it? You ever heard the phrase, I'm getting too old for this? So, Krishna, out of his kindness, he's actually telling you, hey, listen, it's time to get serious. This old bag of bones that you've been dragging around all your life is starting to deteriorate. And that's why there's so many hospitals 
Wherever you go, there's always a good big hospital with loads of people in there going, oh, my back, oh, my leg, oh, my head, oh, my arm. Because in actuality, Krishna is telling them, listen, you don't want to come back here again. Finish your business in this lifetime. Don't waste another lifetime. So therefore, the material energy is created very wonderfully because in one sense, it provides a certain amount of pleasure and it provides a certain amount of pain. And in between, you've got to make decisions. Your position is you can either say, okay, I want to stick it out here and fight till the death and see if I'm going to be happy. Or if you're intelligent, you can say, well, I've done this thing, I've done, I've smoked cigarettes before, I've had this before, I've done that before, I've chased after that, I've watched thousands of videos and films and this thing and television news and read the newspapers till they fall out of my hand or whatever, but I want to start looking for something more. So really, spiritual life means actual becoming greedy. You see? In the material world, people become greedy. But what is their greediness? They're greedy for more suffering. Because if you become more attached to your body, then all it means is that you're going to be born, get old, get diseased, and die. So to become greedy for spiritual life means to realize that actually I want to find out myself. I want to know who I am, what I am, where am I from, where am I going. And who is controlling me? And that is the beginning of spiritual life. That is called a Tata Brahma Jignasya. Ravi, isn't it? Brahma Jignasya means now is the time to wake up. Stop sleeping in the material world, dreaming, constantly dreaming about one day it's going to get better. Because I can tell you, according to logical statistics, Getting old, getting diseased, and dying is not means it's getting better. If you can say getting old is going to, things are going to get better, then you prove that to me. You give me an argument where getting old makes things get better. The body deteriorates. So, therefore, the whole, if you like, incompleteness of the material world is not incomplete at all. It is a complete arrangement so that you can understand that actually I have to stop this silly business of trying to enjoy that which is not enjoyable and begin my real business which is to serve Krishna. So one moment of service to Krishna, one moment of Krishna consciousness is worth millions and millions of lifetimes wasted in the pursuit of material happiness. Because that one moment Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita that one activity which is done in his service will save you from the greatest type of fear. The greatest type of fear is to be born again into the animal kingdom. Because in the animal kingdom, the same miseries are there that you have in the human body, except there's nothing you can do about it. So now, that's what it means, the tata. Now is the time because your consciousness is sufficiently developed now is the chance to actually realize that you're not this body, you have nothing to do with the body, you have nothing to do with the material world, you have nothing to do with the mind and the false ego and the contaminated consciousness, the polluted intelligence, but you have everything to do with the service of Krishna or God. And then, by that dedication of spiritual life, you can go back to home, back to God. So therefore, we have been dedicated to this body for so long, we have done wonderful things and miserable things and whatever for the body, but at the same time, the body itself does not show appreciation because the only thing your body does, after you've spent 80, 90, 100 years cleaning it, looking after it, serving it, bringing it in nice foodstuffs and everything, and all it does is it just falls down, plunk, dead. That's its thankfulness. After all that work you did, it just goes, boom. And that's not very grateful, is it? After a hundred years of service. So in reality, 
If I, it's like a man who builds a big, big house, spends millions of pounds, years and years of his time, and then the whole house goes... How will he feel? Isn't it? Suppose you spent a hundred years building a house, putting nice things in it, decorating it, looking after it, and the whole thing went like a pack of cards went... You'd feel pretty fed up, wouldn't you? So similarly, at the end of your whole lifetime of serving the body, getting at things, making sure it's in a nice warm bed, making sure it has a nice bath, making sure it's got a nice type of toothpaste to use and toothbrushes and making sure it's got a nice sort of uh, facilities and car to sit in and all the rest of it. All it does is keel over. And then when it's when it, when it falls over, after all that work, they come and put it in the dustbin. They pick it up and say, get that out of here quick. And call the ambulance. Get him out of here. He's causing a nuisance here. Isn't it? Suppose you fell dead in the middle of Birmingham High Street. What would they do? They God, get him out of here. Isn't it? They ring an ambulance. And then when the ambulance gets the body, they immediately want to stick it in the ground. Get rid of this. Bury it quick. Isn't it? Everyone's trying to get rid of it. After all that work that you put into it, society and everyone else is trying to get rid of it. And if they can't get it into the ground, they stick it in a fire. Isn't it? Or they start chopping you up and using you for experiments on other things. So, at the end of it all, no one's very grateful for all the service you did, all the times your mind was thinking, I'll do this, I'll do that, and I did this, and I did that, and did that, that, that. The only thing that society answers you with is throwing you away. So when you die, you should leave a note there saying, listen, I've worked so hard on this body, Give it a bit of respect. So therefore people, they do, they give you a little bit of respect because they carry you in a nice car on the way to the crematorium, on the way to the car, and everyone's crying and saying, oh, he was such a great guy, and this, that, the other. But the point is, is that the reality of it all is you are an insignificant product of matter that was flapping around for a few years and you disappear. Back, you put back into the energy again. The earth goes back into the earth, the water goes back into the water, the fire goes back into the fire, the ether goes back into the ether, etc. And the mind travels off on its journey into a new body, carrying with it all its misconceptions that it collected. And this is called the false ego. So your body you've got now is made up of all the rubbish you collected in your last body. So if you collected some nice things, you have a bit of a nice body. If you collected mediocre things, you have a mediocre body. And if you collected a lot of nonsense things, you've got a nonsense body. That's basically the, the way that karma works. So that's why there are three different grades of bodies. There's good bodies, mediocre bodies, and useless bodies. And that's not only in humans, that's in all the species. So therefore, spiritual life means finishing up with this changing body program and going back to home, back to God. Is there any questions? Or arguments or discussions? Anything anyone didn't agree with? If you put two people in the same or similar situations, you know, they've got sort of X amount of money, they've both got the equal amount. Mm. Mm. Is that to do with karma? Yeah, everything is to do with karma because everything is working on action and reaction. This is also the law of physics. Everything works on action and reaction. So there are particularly three different types of things that are going on in the material world. One is called Adidevaka, Adibotika, Adiatmaka. Adidevaka means that the demigod, what we call the devas, are the controllers of the universe. And they cause you certain types of happiness and pleasure, particularly certain types of misery. For instance, the sun causes you, say, to get burnt. So that is Adidevaka. There are hurricanes or rain, too much rain, too much cold, too much distance. These are all Adidevaka. In insurance companies, they call them acts of God. 
So acts of God are called they. Well, we of course they're done by demigods, not actually God demigods, but still they're called Adi Devaka. Adi Bhotika means miseries from other living entities. You get miseries from other people, the tax collector, the, the police, the uh, enemy who doesn't like you, the uh, the uh, dog that comes and bites you, the insect that goes in your ear and you can't get it out. These are called, all called Adi Bhotikas. So these are Adi Bhotikas are, are billions because there's millions and billions of different types of bodies floating around this planet. And they're all causing you some sort of suffering. You get in a tube, on a train, and can't get a seat. Someone's crushing you. Someone smells of garlic or whatever it is. These are all, all Adibhoticas. So, and then there's Adiatmicas. Adiatmicas means misery from the body. Miseries from the mind. Miseries from polluted intelligence, contaminated conscience. So... The body gives you misery, the mind gives you misery. Now sometimes you find as a someone they've got lots of money and they're completely miserable. Now logically you would say to them, listen, you've got all that money, you could do anything you want. Why are you miserable? They're miserable because of their mind. Mind is the greatest suffering. There's no greater suffering than the mind. And because it's such a powerful suffering, it cannot be eliminated by anything gross. You understand? The gross thing means money. It's, it's gross. But the mind, if your mind is suffering, no amount of money. Look at how it huges. There's so many examples of people with huge amounts of money. They lived in complete misery. So therefore, the mind is the one which supersedes everything. If your mind is not happy, no material arrangement will make you happy. And you can see that in a room. You can have five people sitting in a room, four people are joking and laughing, and one person is completely miserable, suicidal. Now the room's the same, the decorations are the same, everything's the same, but that one person is suffering because the mind, mental suffering, is much deeper than gross material suffering. So Adi Bhotika, other living beings, etc., etc., of course, you suffer from other people's minds as well. That's another thing. Not only do you suffer from their bodies, but you suffer from their minds. Because if their minds is, is all crazy, then they start doing crazy things. So you're going to suffer for that. So the point is, is that uh, generally the mind is the greatest type of suffering. And therefore, in the yoga system, the mind is the thing which you have to control first. Unless you control your mind, there's no question of happiness. No question of it. No matter, even if you own the whole... As Christ said himself, he said, what is a man who owns the whole world but loses the eternity of the soul? He's not happy. Some people have got everything they want. They've got everything they want, but they haven't got happiness. And yet, you can find people, I've seen it myself, who've got nothing, and they're very, very happy. See, people think that material acquisition, material possessions make you happy. It's not. It's the mind that makes you happy. If you go along to a multi-billionaire and you give him a new walkerman, he's not going to start rolling in the floor in ecstasy, foaming at the mouth and say, I always wanted a walkerman. How did you get it from me? It's wonderful. But you go to someone in Africa who's never even seen a walkerman and you get, and he's in ecstasy, he's dancing around. Oh, look what I got, look what I got. It's relative. The happiness is relative to the condition. So therefore, what we're dealing with is with conditions, not with happiness. The mind is happy because of certain conditions. It's miserable because of certain conditions. So the real thing is the conditions. That's why everyone spends their life trying to change the conditions. Say, I'm living in this part of Birmingham, I'm miserable. So then I say, I'll move to another part of Birmingham. And I'm still miserable. So then I say, oh, I'll move to another part of the country. I'm still miserable. So I say, I'll move to another country. You see these people going on holiday. They did a survey. They said most divorces come after holidays. Most breakdown in marriages come after people have been on holiday. Why? Because they had all this expectancy that, okay, I'm suffering now. And me and my husband are not getting on very well, but when we go on holiday, we're going to have a great time. 
but they end up arguing the whole holiday. So that's it. That was the last card that they played. They were hoping everything was stacked on that holiday. And now when it's over, divorce. So they, they did it, they surveyed. They found that most divorces come after holidays. So in the material world, we try to make so many adjustments all the time. But in reality, what we're dealing with is the mind. We have to understand what makes the mind happy. <coughs> what makes the mind happy is a very good question. What does make the mind happy? Can anyone answer that? That's a question to the audience. Yeah, Okay, but what makes the mind happy? Even though I agree with you, intelligence is above the mind, but what makes the mind happy? Hmm? Knowledge is more to do with intelligence. The mind really, you see, if you study the subtle body, the mind is very much linked with the heart. A little deeper, pleasure is there, but the mind can only be happy when it's in love. When your mind is in love, then you can be happy. Now, the reason the mind suffers is because in the material world, there is no love. People get some material love, but in actuality, because they're in love with something which is changing, what happens is, you can see it with people. They marry, they're together for 30 years, the relationship goes through all its ups and downs, etc., etc. But when the person dies, the other person suffers even more. Because the attachment they had to that other body now is causing them more distress because they're in separation. They're losing that relationship. So the love, condition of love, is the thing which the mind requires. But we try to love things which are not capable of reciprocation of reciprocating our love. So in the material world, we are loving matter. Spiritual life means to love spirit, God. God is the supreme spirit. He is the supreme lovable object. So, unless you develop love for God, you cannot actually become happy. And that's why Christ, again, I use him because there's many examples in his Christian religion also, that one has to develop love for God. Every religion that is teaching is the same thing. One has to develop love for God. So Krishna says, I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who perfectly know this engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. You see? With all their hearts. So the question is, is, where is the heart? If your heart is not absorbed in God, then you will suffer. You will suffer because the anything else will not satisfy you. So people say they're in love, but really, most conditions, if you study them, people are loving their false ego. They're loving their bodies. So that condition of pure love is very, very rare. That's why 2,000 years later people worship Christ because he had love for God. Just like we also love Prabhupada because he had love for God. These great personalities are loved because they had love for God, which is very, very rare. And when you love God, you automatically love everything because God is manifested in everything. It's like pouring water on the root of the tree. Automatically, all the branches and leaves of the tree are nourished. When you love God, you will be completely nourished. You won't need all these other things. That's why devotees don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't watch television, they don't watch newspapers, they don't gamble, they don't do so many things. Not because they shouldn't do it, because they don't need it. It's not required. And a devotee is very anxious to chant Hare Krishna because he chants out of love. If you don't have love when you're chanting, you also won't be able to chant. So therefore a devotee 
Haridas Thakur, so many devotees would chant 23 and a half hours a day. See? Now, we cannot sit there and chant 23 and a half hours a day because when we sit down to chant, our mind says, what are you doing here? <laughs> what are you doing sitting down here chanting Hare Krishna? You should be finding out what's the latest gossip. You should go around the temple and find out what's going on. You're missing things. You should see what's going on out there. You should go into town and have a look around. You might see something you haven't seen before. Don't sit here chanting Hare Krishna. You're wasting your time. And you say, hey, you're right. You get your bead bag and you go... (laughs) Put it in a dusty corner so it'll collect dust and off you go, looking. Where's the gossip? Where's the thing? Where's that? What happened? Oh, you heard something? What'd you hear? Oh, really? Oh. (laughs) Or you put on the news. Family of 18 killed in motorway. Oh, really? What happened? Oh, bodies strewn everywhere. Blood on the lamppost. Oh, really? On the lamppost there was blood. Oh, this is really important. So you spend hours looking and looking. But the bead bag just lies there. And then you find out you're dying. Oh, God, 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 where's my bead bag? Where's my bead bag? <laughs> God, God, I was really praying. I was really praying. I'll chant. Don't worry. I'm sorry. I really didn't mean to do it. See? So when people know they're dying, then they become so religious. But well, meanwhile, they spend a the whole lifetime looking at everyone else dying. Hearing about everyone else. So therefore, unless one has love in his heart, he cannot actually become free from the mind. Because the mind is distracted because it has no goal. It has no goal. The mind has to have a goal in life. In the material world, we find so many material goals. But they don't satisfy us. That's why someone wants to become president, somebody wants to become a big scientist, somebody wants to become a big uh, historian, a a, a big uh, businessman, somebody wants to become a big cook, somebody wants to become a big road sweeper, whatever they want to become. Shema Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.